Same word, but in a new form, on a new understanding, in a new concept. The Arab couldn't then simply match something like that. How can they say like, how can I say something like that? It doesn't mean to me anything, worlds. That is how the level of the difficulty they found, even today, because they don't even speak like that. To give you another example, or like the same example, Alhamdu is a definitive article with praise. Hamd means praise. And it says Alhamd, the praise, all praise. Now Arabs never, how do we know that? Because the comparison has been done by a scholar called Dr. Bassam Sa'i, and he's gone into the pre-Islamic literature of poetry, called the uh, Ashar, Ashar al-Jahiliya, pre-Islamic poetry, compared the Quran and compared the statements of the Prophet recorded in the Hadith. He could not find a single instance of the, the way of the word praise used in the beginning of a sentence with a definite article. The Arabs will use this word in the middle of the definite article, but with indefinite article like Hamdan Lillahi Rabbil Alameen, they should have said. So Quran introduces a form which is they're not familiar. What are you talking about? But they understood the meaning. And it was eloquent and it was meaningful, meaning all praises are to God. Not little bit, some praise, but all praises because he's dual praise. So the language, even though it was new, there's linguistic novelty, and yet it was understood as eloquent, as meaningful, and even though it may even defy the grammatical norms that they face, but they understood the meaning. So they didn't care because, remember, language evolves. People make up the grammar during the usages, right? So the Quran came and introduced the ways and forms of how it introduced the speech. That's how the Arabic language was codified. Rather, the Arabic grammar was codified, Quran being a primary source. This is the first book in the Arabic language, in Arabic history. He didn't want to identify himself Arabic, he would know very well, that's why. So when the Quran brought things which looked ungrammatical to them, Sorry. <laughs> interesting, ungrammatical, that is the linguistic norm the Quran introduced in this called the classical Arabic that the Quran uh, brought about to the people. So what did the Arabs at that time pride with? They, proud, they pride themselves with two things. Birth of a male baby and the origination or creation of a beautiful poetry. They would hang this poem in the wall of the Kaaba. And the longer it stays, for example, the more eloquent it is. That's why some of the ones known to us to one is called the Mu'allaqat. And there's seven of them famous. Sab'a Mu'allaqat. It's been translated by Professor A.J. Arbery. You can read them um, in, a, in a very beautiful way and you can appreciate even in English how it is composed by those points in the way they describe. You know, when people describe about love, about the nature and so on, each poet was surpassing everyone else in a particular topic of interest. For example, someone would describe about wine and he would describe with metaphors, with simile, with all this form, no other poet could surpass him in, in this eloquence and excellence. So when you have textual critics, they will say, no one can match him in this style. When the Quran came... Yeah. I see your role in a long time, and you're saying a lot, but from my understanding, I see you basically well learned in the doctrine. So my question to you, outside of the doctrine itself, do you have any personal evidence for Allah? Yeah. Your person, not, not another man experience. Your yeah. personal experience. So, so when we saw a personal experience. you. Yeah, when we talk about personal experience. Mm -hmm. So are you happy with subjective experience to arbitrate truth? Definitely. But the thing is. It it's not lead, scientific. No, it could lead to truth, but it might not be the objective truth. So anyone who says, I've experienced God who is a monkey. Is that the true reality? That's his reality. So that means subjective reality is not equal to the absolute reality. Exactly absolute right. reality should be free from subjective perception. Right. So what's the difference so, between that statement and you saying... No, what I'm saying is, if I give you my experience, it doesn't necessitate it's true. Because it's my experience no, no, true to me, not to you. No, we're having a conversation, not a fight. I can be satisfied, I can be dissatisfied with whatever argument you put forward. But I'm asking you, what's your testimony and experience? Yeah, I go by objective evidence rather than subjective experience. Okay. That's how I operate. Yeah. I go by the ones which make sense to me. Objective evidence where everyone can come, 
assess, scrutinize and verify rather than subjectively someone says someone came in my dream and he was wearing white clothes, I saw bright light and there was a tunnel. Now I'm giving you an example and he says okay, I am God and hallelujah for example. Now to me these kind of experiences can be had by various peoples of religion and of no religion. You can give us a spectrum of people coming up with all these experiences and it doesn't mean it's true because we know sometimes how emotionally people can experience these things because of the, the makeup and because of the release of different hormones and different chemicals within the body. People can be triggered to have these experiences. That is why you'll find many of the people who want this kind of spiritual experiences, do you know what they have? Ganja, hashish, marijuana, all these hallucinogens, all these drugs that really interferes with your nervous system, right? So we know that because I am from that field, yeah, I deal with reality, drugs, so I know how yeah, yeah, this but, works. But to reality and the actual question, yeah. what's your personal evidence for God? Right, Allah? objective evidence. God, yeah. okay. someone objectively we know exists because of, because of hard facts, because of the reality. Let me tell you how I deduce that. When we look at the objective, when we look at the reality around us, I know mm -hmm. that everything is contingent, dependent. Everything is depending on something else. Everything that you can imagine is dependent. The whole set will be dependent. Now, if something is dependent on something else, as a set, you have to explain how does it even exist? Because this existence needs an explanation. If it was independent, that's something different. So a dependent set of things requires to depend on something necessarily who is independent. So our universe must rely, must be dependent on something independent and we call that the necessary existence. It has to be existence that is necessary. And a quality of a necessary existence would be someone or something that is self-sufficient, independent. So when I look at this universe, when I look at myself, we know there has to be, there has to be an existence that is necessary and that existence will be something that is not dependent on anything. That means that existence of that being will be something that is not somehow influenced by anything. So that existence will not be restrained. So this existence will be eternal with no beginning and will have continuous subsistence of the existence, it everlasting with no end. And how do I even know that if you think about it? If something exists now, which is you and me, there cannot be a time in the distant past where there was absolute nothingness. Because absolute nothingness is the absence of energy, time, quanta, gravity, hadrons, leptons, gluons, you name it, quantum fields. That's what I mean by absolute nothingness. Have you ever communicated with that entity? Wait, 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 before you go into that, because you asked me to prove, let me establish that there is indeed a necessary existence. Yeah, but I'm saying you don't have to give me a whole lecture before you get to the... I'm summarizing. That's a long if it was a lecture, it would be like three hours. I'm just summarizing it. So I'm, I'm giving you the necessary elements for my argument. I can't miss the necessary elements. So if, if, if something exists now, something, that requires an explanation. Because I could rather ask you, why does something exist rather than nothing? Because if nothing existed, I don't need an explanation. Because by default, there should be nothing. But the fact that something exists requires an explanation of its existence. We exist. That means there cannot be a time in the distant past where there was absolute nothingness. Now, if this is the case, something has to be always there. Either it's our universe or the cause of our universe. Our universe is dependent, our universe is contingent. It has to then depend on something that is independent. And that's what we're saying. The necessary existence is something that is always there in existence, is that absolute entity, the absolute reality. And that as the reality, we can now start utilizing our faculty of intellect that we now have, is that must be one, must be one. Where's the evidence for it? I should have asked you before. Evidence. evidence is of different kinds. I'm not talking about the current evidence, I'm talking about you. I'm, I'm telling you, evidence comes in different types. There are, there are empirical evidence for empirical things. There are rational evidence for rational things. For example, I do not need to produce or do any experiments in any lab on planet Earth to tell you that there are no married bachelor in any way in our cosmos. I don't have to do any experiments in a lab. There are no married bachelor in any way in the cosmos. In our, not just Milky Way galaxy, I'm taking the whole reality. No married bachelor in existence, no squared circles. Now, did I need to do an experiment? No. How did I deduce that? 
This is called the principle of non-contradictions because these are contradictory terms. You cannot be married and bachelor at the same time. So it is called a rational evidence by the principles of logic and non-contradictions. So when you ask for evidence, do not automatically assume, my friend, only empirical evidence through experimentation, observation and replication. Evidence can be mathematical, evidence can be rational, like I'm providing to you a rational evidence that there is a necessary existence. That's like universal evidence. I'm talking hmm? about you personally. That's my personal experience to you have in the form of objective evidence. Have you ever directly communicate or talk to that entity? Yeah, have that entity has that five entity has ever revealed anything? Firstly, I am moving away from personal experience to something that is objectively demonstrable. So I am saying there is a necessary being and my next point would be that necessary being has to be one absolute being rather than many. What's the being? Tell me what's the being like? Existence. What is it okay. or he? That existence, if you think about it, because it is unlike any of the dependency, this independent existence will have its own reality. Because if you think, if you give anything like that, you are bringing some constraints. So in the Quran, the way it's depicted, the way this necessary being is depicted, is there's no comparison, no likeness whatsoever of this existence. He's unlike anything. And I think it makes sense because something that is not constrained and limited and dependent like our universe will be unlike this. So it has to be a different genre, a different category, a different type. And that's why the absolute existence is in the reality of his own existence. Is it physical? Hmm? Is it physical? What do you mean by physical? Tell me first. See, you can see or touch. Is gravity physical? Probably using your senses, maybe. Existence, existence of our creator is real. So I can differentiate with word real and not real, imaginary, illusionary and reality. Real existence as to what constitutes the essence or what makes God God or the creator creator. That thing that makes the substance of it is something that is beyond our imagination. It is not something so, that... So you're talking about something that is beyond your imagination. It is transcendent to you because you know yeah. nothing about it. Other than what the book as, as, as a finite individual, you cannot speculate about the reality, the substance, what makes God God or the creator the creator. Okay, so you're shocked yeah? as it relates to that. No, no you, you cannot because you're limited with your mental faculties to how much you can ascertain about the reality of this necessary being. But you can ascertain that must be absolute, must be one, must be possessor of knowledge, must be and possessor you of power. Absolutely believe. Hmm? Absolutely. absolutely believe. Because it's demonstrable. It's demonstrable. Yeah. So, as I said, not only the existence... You don't even sit on the fence, you're absolutely sure about Absolutely it. sure, 100%. So, what we're saying is, this necessary being is not only absolute, but one. Because you can only have one of those absolute beings. So you can one, have more than one. So, if it's one, it's visible, right? Hmm? It's visible, you can see. Why, why do you bring visibility into it? To give you an example. Because as humans, we no, no, things... No, no, to give you an example. Do you see energy? We can be um, deductor. I didn't say about deduction. Do you see energy? No, we, we can't physically see. Why not? I'm not a scientist. I can't go into that. Okay. Guess. Why can't we see energy? I don't know. Right. We are not capable. Our eyes have a particular way of acquiring vision and it's limited in its spectrum. We cannot see something as ultraviolet or infrared. You know your remote control? When you press the button, your TV or your video or your whatever PlayStation, it starts, switched on. Did you see anything going? You didn't see anything going. The animals like dogs and other things, they can see other spectrum, which we can't see. So we are constrained in the tools that we have, how much and what we can see. You cannot then bring this and say, how is it possible to see our creator? I would say, we are not equipped with the tools to see our creator so in this it's a life. Feeling, not a fact. No, no, no. It's not a. a feeling, it's not a. It's not about a feeling. It's not. It's not a feeling. Um, let me tell you why it's not a feeling. Gravity. We know it exists. No disrespect. No, no, no. What I'm saying is no. Fine, fine. But what, the way I see it is, gravity. I cannot see. I cannot touch. I cannot feel. What pulls it down is a force which I can't feel. I can only feel the thing that goes down.
I can't feel gravity in any way. Gravity is beyond our sense perception, but we know it exists. So the fact that God exists or our Creator exists, it doesn't automatically mean I have to feel Him, see Him, touch Him, smell Him. Or, yeah, it doesn't have to be. So our sense, perspe sense perception may be limited in this life, but in the hereafter, in a second life, we are told that we will, we, will, we will see God in the hereafter, those who deserve to see Him. But we, 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 but isn't that, we rely on our senses. but we rely on our senses even to believe in gravity when we can't even sense it. Do you see that? We do sense it every time. Well, we're standing here firm, aren't we? No, no, you haven't sensed gravity. All you've seen, there's a force somehow in effect, the effect of gravity. You haven't sensed gravity, seen gravity, smelled, touched, felt it. It's the effect, effect. So the creation, yeah, the, all we see is the effect of our creator. So in the hereafter, we are told that we will see Yeah, um, The ayah goes like this, the word in a, in a very rhyming way, that, you know, that, that the, the faces will be radiant in, the, in, that, in that day by seeing their Lord. If you read some of the scripture of the Judeo-Christian uh, community, they will tell you that Moses was asking God, I want to see you. And God says, you can't see me. The Bible says he saw Moses. Hmm? The Bible. I know you're not a biblical person, but the Bible says Moses spoke to God face to face. Yeah, as a friend. He asked. So just as we're talking face to face. He asked to see God, and God said, "You can't see me." In the Quran, it says, "God says, Lantarani, you won't see me." But look, okay, look at this mountain. If you can see the mountain still standing, then perhaps you might see me. And guess what? When God reveals some of His tajalla, some of His glory. The mountain crumbled to dust. Noor, noor crumbled to dust. Moses fell unconscious and he raised and he says, Okay, I am so sorry. He apologized to God that he realized how can he even see? Look, can you even look at the sun for a few seconds when the bright light? You can't. Your eyes will be destroyed. That sun, nothing compared to so many other stars which are so bright. God says he is Noor Samawati Wal Ard. He is the, he is the light of the heaven and the earth as a metaphorical in a way. like. How can you, how can you even see God? You can't. Do you think? Do you think? Just to just to add, do you think a bacteria or a virus that are on our skin can appreciate how we look like? Never. Even if they had the sentience and the capacity, because they're too small to us. Look how we are small compared to this Earth, like a speck. This Earth is like a speck in the solar system. The solar system is like a speck in our Milky Way galaxy. Where's paradise in the cosmos? Uh, it's, a it's a separate creation. Separate creation. Separate creation. So if you think about now, there's there's a YouTube clip. It demonstrates to you your position compared to different galaxies and all the way across. You will see that you are insignificant speck upon a speck upon a speck. You are nothing. And God, he says, his kursi, his footstool, extends over the heavens and the earth. Such is our Sovereign Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and we want to imagine, we want to see God. You can't even see what you see over there, and you want to see God so in this question. life? Not possible. One question. You said footstool. Yeah. Is that a metaphor? It can, it can, it can literally... No. The reality of God is such that he describes a throne and a footstool and so on. We cannot neglect and reject this meaning in terms of what is ascribed to themselves. Because as a finite human beings, we have to accept what is literally true. Only when things are literally impossible by the mind and so on, our scholars have said, you can assign a metaphorical meaning. So both meaning, metaphor, for example, God, to give you an example, a clear example. In the Quran, God says, the, there are people who say, Yadullah maghlula. The hands of God are tied. Tied. You know, like bound tied. Right? Mm -hmm. Allah says no. Bal yadahu mabsutatan. But his hands are outstretched. Now think about it. In the context of the scripture, God is not demonstrating that he's got two hands. He's simply saying there are community people who are saying God is a miser. He doesn't spend, he doesn't give provision. And God says no, his hands are outstretched, meaning he's so generous. So the figurative meaning is contextual. But it doesn't neglect, literally it could be true. 
that God has hands in this reality. So it's, a, it's, it's there's lots of metaphors, and then it's up to you as the no, in language. Describer. In language, when you have a text, you cannot simply reject the text because you think, oh, how can God have eyes or hands? Nobody um, knows. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, because the existence of that reality is not like us. The hands of a clock. Is it like your hand? It's not like your hand. But we understand it means, oh, there's a hand that goes around and, and a second and so on. So when we talk about the hands of God, we don't mean like our hands, the reality in God's reality. Yeah. So we as Muslims do not make, yeah, we as Muslims do not interpret away. We do not interpret it away and say, no, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean hands, it only means power. We know, no. We know that God, our Allah, he communicates with people, right? Yeah. Good. Has he ever communicated with you? He communicates to special chosen ones who deserves, not sorry, who he considers to be worthy of sending communications because he has chosen from the people. So he has never communicated to you. Let me, let me finish. One second. Are we even worthy of direct communication from God? What have you and I, what is our worth? that God is somehow bound to communicate to you directly and says, with loves and kisses, this is my book to you. you yeah? Mean, yeah? You so when God, when God yeah. communicates, yeah. when God communicates through history, what he has done, he has tell, he told us there's few forms of communication. God can communicate to people in the dreams, behind the veil, or sending a messenger, for example. Now, Whatever you receive in dreams, this will be subjective as we discussed already. Even though it can be from God directly. Like when Prophet Abraham, he was commanded in his dream, in his vision, to sacrifice something which is dearest to him. So when he was about to sacrifice his dearest son, and God substituted this with a ram, God says, Saddaqta ru'ya. You have completed, you have now, you know, What's this called? Like, you know, being, being truthful and trustworthy yes. and you have passed your test. Yeah. What he has commanded you. That means God did command him even in his vision, even in his dream. So God can communicate. Prophet Muhammad wasallam, spoke to God directly behind the veil in heaven. But the vast majority of the prophets and messengers that God spoke to is through sending an angel of communication, angel Gibril or Jibril or Gabriel, through which God communicated to them about his revelation. And that form of communication, we would say, is something demonstrably, verifiably, something that you can prove its, um, and, and ascertain its uh, validity. Because you can look at this revelation that has brought through the angel Gabriel to the prophet, and then you can analyze it. Because now you've got data point at front of you. As a data point, you can then say, let me scrutinize it. So we say most of the time, prophets and messengers were the chosen ones of God, that God chose from the community who were the most upright, who were the most truthful, the most able person that people can believe in, so that God can relay his message to them. So why you can't be that person? Why you can't be upright and truthful? No, no, no. God chooses from among the people, his prophets and messengers. He's done that already. And to answer your question, he's already chosen the last messenger. There will be no other prophet and messenger after him. So he has to speak to anyone since 1400 years ago? There will be no prophet and messenger after, after Prophet Muhammad well, we God has already sealed. His, so, so everything is shut down from that? No. Messengership and prophethood is closed. Because the Quran, you, you might ask, you might all ask, why so? Why so? And it's actually quite reasonable to ask. In the past, there were communities who needed guidance from God, and they only needed guidance for their own community. For example, when the Torah came, was the Torah sent to the Indonesians? It wasn't. Neither did Moses go to Indonesia, peace be upon him, because it was localized for the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. People were in a, you know, close communities, and prophets and messengers were sent. And in fact, in the Quran, God tells us that he doesn't punish a nation until and unless he sends a prophet or a messenger, a warner, to tell them what is required of them. It's rational, it's just. And he tells us that every community, every nation had a prophet or a messenger, a warner. Putting this together, now we know, all these communities that we see, they had prophets and messengers to them in the past.
And that is why we are able to find remnants of truth in their traditions, whether the scripture that they left behind or they're still reading, or their traditions they still follow. If you go to books of Hindus or even other people that you think they're pagans, if they have a root there, they will see there's the a common denominator of a belief in a higher being, right? Even in Africa or somewhere they go at Natu, someone with no, you know, back passage, right? Because they had someone, a concept of a supreme being that doesn't need to eat or defecate because he is self-sufficient. So these kind of things are still remnant and still available to us. So in the past, close-knit communities have prophets and messengers sent. But as communities came together because of transportation and traveling and, 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 and vehicles of transport and so on became so available, it became so easy and easy to send a revelation to multiple communities. So when the Quran was sent, even though the initial recipients were the Arabs, Quran was sent for the whole of the world. As the Quran says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ God says, I have not sent you except to be the, the mercy for the whole of the worlds. Whole of the worlds, not just the earth. Whole of the worlds. Whole of the worlds. So, now one may ask, how is it then? Is this a guidance from God? which will be sufficient enough for all times and all places. Because if a guidance is now the final, it needs to incorporate all our problems that we might face, all the scenarios that we might face where we need divine arbitration and guidance, in which rather than like what the communists did in communist Russia, all this thing that they did and they killed millions of people and then it fell. No one is now advocating for socialism, only a few people, right? So God doesn't leave us by sending a final revelation and then we find out we don't have a guidance. So if you know, this is the beauty of Islam when you just look at it from that angle. Sharia you've heard, cutting of the hands and this, but Sharia is a complete law that God has given us for all times and all places. So even if you are a professor or you are a person on the street, you are rich or you are poor, the guidance can be applicable to both of you. Addresses to your level and to their level. This is the language of the Quran. Understood by the laity and understood by the scholarship. So if you want a guidance, for example, oh, what do we want to do in euthanasia? Abortions, um, cloning, new things that have come across in the centuries. It's not had a guidance for that. Because God has completed, perfected his guidance in the form of Quran. As the Quran says, Al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum. Today, this day, I have perfected your religion. I have completed your religion and chosen this as Islam. So God has perfected and He's given us His favor so that we do not have to somehow, you know, be in confusion and say, what are we going to do? So the Quran and the teaching of the Prophet becomes the foundation of all our problems that we may fight ever. Jurisprudence, ethics, morality, economics, you name it, everything is derivable from these two sources. Is the Quran that's currently written um, the exact same scripture from the past times? Or has it been amended in any ah, Very, very beautiful, intelligent question. 1440... I'm whether the current Quran, whether the scripture has been edited or amended in any way over yeah. the years. Yeah, because that, that is a very intelligent question. Do you, know, do you know why it's a valid question? Because if that Quran as a guidance was given 1400 years ago, we're talking about when there were no photocopy machines, when there were no digital media to save. And I think that's why I asked the question, because you said there's no more... After Muhammad, there will never be another... Um, prophet, prophet or uh, messenger, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was wondering, is he the last person? The questions edit? come from an intelligent lady. I'm telling you, it's a beautiful question from someone who's intelligent. So the reasons why it is important for us to know that is just a sidetrack. I was specifically giving a talk on this subject earlier on with my brother Abbas on this very topic of preservation of scripture earlier on. So we, um, once it's uploaded, I very much you know, invite you to um, listen to it in, in Dawawise and EF Dawa. On YouTube, on Dawawise and EF Dawa, they will upload it maybe in a few weeks' time, right? Dawawise, yeah, and EF Dawa. This special, there were some interruptions, but the message is, is uh, 
clearly communicated, I'm sure, alhamdulillah. So, but to answer your question, it is only logical that if a book is going to be there for all of posterity to guide people, it needs to be preserved. It needs to be unadulterated and uncorrupted. So in the Quran, in fact, the author of the Quran, God, he himself says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. We have surely have revealed the Quran and we are its guardian protectors. We doesn't mean more than one. God is speaking in authority and might. This is the Arabic language of the Quran. So God himself says, La yatihil batil from the, the, the no, sorry, no false would come to from behind or from between and so on and so forth. It is a, 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 a scripture that has been protected. And the reason so that because there will be no other revelation, God has taken on himself the preservation of the book. You might ask in a, in, as a side point, why didn't God preserve the previous scriptures? God tells us in the Quran, the preservation task and the role and the duty was given to the learned elders, the rabbis and the priests of those communities and they failed to do so. They will be accountable in the day of judgment why they didn't. Even though the, the laws may not still be applicable to them, but still it can be seen how this law was applied to them, right? Even if you find the laws of Noah, for example, you can still see these were the laws. Out of historical interest, it is important. But they failed to do that in their job. Rather, there were communities. The Quran says, Woe to them who write the scripture with their own hands and say, this is God. Woe to them for what they write and what they miserably earn. There were communities who were writing scripture and say, ah, this is from God. To give you an example, I'm sure you've not read the Gospel of Ebionites, the Gospel of Nazarene, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Infancy, Gospel of Thomas. There are 49 Gospels extant by bits and pieces. I've given you, I've given you five examples so far, right? Many Gospels. They are called apocryphal Gospels. Do you know why? Because they're not in the main Bible. But the fact that there were people who believed in Christ and they were writing this as his gospel, right? It didn't end up in a accepted collection of books called the Bible, but people are writing it. Now we say these are forgeries in the name of God. So we know historically people were forging and making up things and say this is from God. The Quran alludes to them and say, woe to them, woe to those people who do that and say it's from God. So the Quran firstly then tells you they failed to do so and God has taken himself the task of preservation how does he do that? God says, La tuharrik bihi lisan. Um, how does the ayah go? Lita'ajala bihi. Inna alayna jam'ahu wa qur'ana. Fa'idha qara'nahu, fattabi' qur'ana. You see how they all memorize this? Because that's the Arabic language of the Quran. We, we kept it the way it is. So God says, don't, to the Prophet, don't haste in turning your tongue and, and, and and, and to read and to reveal, um, write the Quran or to deliver the Quran, to, to haste on it. Don't, 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 don't do this thing. He says, Inna alayna Qur'ana. To us, God, it's his collection and its recitation. So God has taken off this task. So how do we know this is the case? The Quran, as it was revealed to the Prophet's heart, heart, not his mind. The Quran says, the angel Gabriel came and revealed the Quran his, his heart. His heart was a receptacle. And the Quran was dictated by the Prophet and his scribes, his official scribes, Zaid bin Thabit and various others, they transcribed it and then they recited back to him. One thing which I haven't said is the Prophet was an illiterate individual. He did not know how to read and write. So God gave him this oral recitation who memorized, passed on orally. But when people wrote it, he asked them to recite back and he could correct them if they written it wrong. So that was written and memorized. Memorized and written. Graphic and oral. Two forms side by side. So they were told like the importance of learning. It's like when you read the Quran, your station, if you read one letter, like Alif and Lam and Meme, you have all these rewards. The more you read, the more higher and higher your station is in the hereafter in terms of reward. Imagine the one who has memorized the whole of the Quran, his station and honor that he has in the form of God. 
And because of these, I'm giving you one example. There are many, many people who started memorizing the Quran. And not only that they were able to do so, God made it easy to remember. God says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ God has made easy for the Quran to remember. So who would take heed and remembrance? And that is why the Quran, even though it's not poetry, it has rhymes. Even though it's not prose, but it, it makes it easy to memorize. It has rhymes and rhythm. It, it somehow resonates within you. Reson that is why I'm asking you, humbly listen to the Quranic recitation in YouTube. You will see how your heart and your mind resonates. You will feel it. You will feel it. Right. So the Quran, the Quran, then Prophet instructs them to memorize it and tells you the importance of memory and the reward of memory and say memorized it. Many, many companions memorized it. At one point, what happened is in the Battle of Yamama, because in the early times, the Arabs had wars and battles between them. They, they wanted to totally eliminate the Prophet because he's now saying all of these idols no longer to be worshipped, but worship one and true God. So they started fighting him and so on. They wanted to get rid of him altogether. So at one point in the Battle of Yamama, many of the Quran memorizers were getting martyred. So it alarmed a Khalif. The, the person at that time, he says, okay, now, because of this now, let us now collect the Quran in a bound form, in a mushaf, in, in, a, in a way, collected form. Because during the time of the Prophet, the Quran was continuously revealed. There was no need to sort of put it in a book because constantly being revealed, some new chapters, new verses, and Prophet would instruct from God, place it here in between these lines, place it here in that chapter. You can't have a bound book, it's an open book. But as he passed away, the Quran is no longer receiving any revelation. So the Quran was with them in their manuscript forms, in their texts, whether they wrote in the shoulders of a camel or a goat, on the date palm stalk or in the papyrus, whatever the form. So they said, okay, let us now collect together in one form so that it's no longer lost. Because what's happening is many of the Muslims, they're dying, being martyred, and the Quran is going from their hearts as well as their, what's in their possession. So they, com they compiled or collated and then they said, okay, now they will leave that with that particular Khalif. When the Khalif died, they left up with his daughter. There was no need to circulate the Quran because people had their own copies. It was a living tradition. Only when later they wanted to recirculate again, they brought this one back and they had a whole thing again in terms of, oh, I didn't tell you how it was collected. Every single verse, every single verse had to be brought forward who had directly written in the presence of the Prophet and bring two witnesses. So was, so was the Quran written in the time of the Prophet? Yes, the all of it. it in, the time of the in the time of the Prophet, all of it. It was written and completed. The Quran was written, all of it, in various people's hands. And that's when you said they collated the But it, it, was not, it was not compiled officially as like one bound book. So everyone had, some people had few chapters, some people had whole of the Quran and so on. Remember at that time in antiquity, parchment was very expensive. So people would write in stones, in the, in the blade of a shoulder bone of a camel or, 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 or some goat and so on as transcribed. Some of the practices still going on today. So as much as they had the material, they would write. So Quran was available in written form as the Prophet passed away, all of it. So when they... No, no, at that time, because okay. the Quran didn't, Islam didn't spread all over the world. Afterwards, when the Khalifs, they, they went and opened up other lands, the Quran spread. Okay, this is what, but at that time, they've already officially compiled a particular, what we call Uthmanic Mus'haf in a specific writing convention. So everyone can follow that. Before that, all of that was compiled from primary witnesses who were directly who heard from the Prophet ﷺ in his presence and brought two witnesses. Every single verse of it. That's why we have that guarantee that when they compiled, just to finish this point is, is mm -hmm. crucial, it wasn't a copy of a companion of a Prophet or his disciple. Because you might ask, but he might have made some mistakes mm -hmm. in transcription. Yeah. yeah. But when we have every single verse has been community um, approved, all of the Muslims, it was like this. In the Masjid of Medina, 
official edict is like the Quran is going to be compiled. Bring your verses, ayat that you have written directly in the presence of the Prophet and bring true witnesses. Everyone brought and testified and they said, okay, fine, this is this. Eventually, and to the point, even though the, the one who was transcribing in this project, Zaid bin Thabit, he had his own copy. He got all of it except two verses. He was waiting and waiting. How did he know there was two verses more? Not only because he had his own copy, not only because he's in his own memory, but he knows this is what the Quran is. And no one denied that all completed the Quran when they were waiting for a person who directly wrote it in the presence of the Prophet. And eventually came Khuzayma bin Thabit al-Ansari, the companion, and they collated that Quran finalized. So that means what they did as a project, a community project in which the companions, the disciples of Prophet Muhammad Islam, all agreed that this is the Quran that Prophet Muhammad left behind. And now what we have is copies of those. So if you now compare the oral transmissions, if you now compare the manuscripts from anywhere you go, you'll find this is uniformity, right? Because that is the level of preservation of the text of the Quran in a graphic form, in an oral form. The more and more we discover, the more and more our traditional understanding of the Quran textual transmission is affirmed by scholarship. Yeah. So why do you have so many different branches of Muslim reading from the one book? Very good point. I asked the same question. Why would Muslim differ? Because maybe some kind of sectarian bias. Think about it. You had some kind of love with affiliating with a particular family member. You become so blind. You say, no, I'm going to listen to whatever he says, even though the evidence is the contrary. And I'm going to give you one example, a direct example from my own experience you asked before. I'm giving you that one experience now. Once I was asked to be in the jury service. I hope no one asked me again in the jury service. So we had a number of people. There was one gentleman. We had quite trouble in, in agreeing to in, in the process of how we are going to make our decisions. So that particular individual, we said, look, so far, I mean, this is the case, I'm not sure why they involve us lay people in decision making of a crime. Islam has totally different way of solving these problems. A, a judge and evidence and, and jury and so on. But here, people, lay people deciding on the, the fate of an individual, you have no training on this matter. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, gimmicks. Anyway, so this individual gentleman, he said, look, even if you give me evidence, evidence, video evidence that he actually raped that individual, my conscience tells me, sorry, even if you give me evidence to the contrary that he's not guilty, that there was no evidence someone else did it. He says, no, my conscience tells me he's guilty. I will say, yes, he's guilty. We could not argue with him, so eventually we had to dismiss him. Not we, the judge dismissed him because we couldn't agree together. We, we, we could not agree to a uniform decision because that individual, but that tells you, someone, he's made up his mind. He says, Ignorance. my conscience tells me this person is guilty. Even if you bring evidence, I'm not going to take evidence to account. You can't. That is why sectarianism was such that people affiliated with a particular line of community or people or groups and they kept on following that even though evidence was to the contrary but they still had the one the Quran because that's the beauty again the Quran is the same Quran but somehow they started going offshoot politically and otherwise in fact many of the Islam's offshoots were political divisions they wanted like Shia for example if you ask the Shias now they will tell you this is the case they wanted the fourth Khalif to be the first Khalif he became the Khalif eventually, Ali radiallahu an. They wanted him to be the Prophet's successor as a Khalif, leader of the Muslims, to, to lead the Muslim community. Not to be a Prophet, but to be a leader of the Muslims. They wanted Ali to be the first one rather than Abu Bakr who became the first one. But look at it, when Ali became the Khalif, the matter should be settled, right? They should say now he's the Khalif, but they didn't know. They kept on continuing a group of, and, and they started formulating beliefs which now have become theological differences. For example, some of them believe, a faction of them, that they have these 12 Imams. Yeah? And these 12 Imams, they are in control of every single atom of the universe. Not God, but the Imams. The Imams knows the point of they're going to die and so on. When the Quran says, no soul knows. 
when they're going to die, in which land they're going to die. Because death can come anytime and you don't know. No, known to God only. They say their Imams knows when and how, as if they're in control. They're controlling every single atom of the universe. That's why some of them even ask them for help and sustenance when God says no. Udu'uni astajib lakum. Call upon me, I will answer your prayers, God says. But they, they have to call upon them. So that's why they've gone offshoot. But the fact that still, for the benefit of people in general, the Quran is still available as one Quran, one message from God for all of the people, for all of posterity. Basically, the proof is in the pudding. You know what I mean? Yeah. The coin of freeze. So we know now, the other things which I didn't mention is, have you ever been to a mosque in, in Ramadan? No, I'd like to go. Right, please do visit next time because we just had Ramadan a few months ago. What happens in Ramadan in the mosques is a tradition that Muslims recite the whole of the Quran from memory from beginning to end. All Quran. You will see the Imam reciting in prayer aloud. And he's appointed certain people only who can correct him because he's received from memory. But the tendency of people from the back rows, because it's row by row, right? Imam making mistake. He says like, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. He says, no, Rabbil Alameen. They, they want to correct him because they know it by heart. They're so enthusiastic. So whole of the Quran, you will see, is recited from memory and being corrected if he makes some mistakes with all these enthusiasts, young ones and old ones who want to correct him throughout the Muslim world. This practice has been going on for centuries. If the Quran has been orally recited from memory to memory, today, yesterday, the year before, the decades before, the century before, you would know how the Quran has been preserved in the hearts of the people. Today, a five-year-old, a six-year-old can memorize the whole Quran. YouTube, go and check again. Young child memorizes the whole Quran. How is it possible a book, you know, 600 pages, in Arabic language and this person doesn't even know Arabic and memorize the whole of the Quran yes, sir, not ahead. only not only the text as you, you read but with the nagma with the recitation of with the articulation when they say for example um, if I say my recitation is that good but if I say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen I elongate it right even to that level they have memorized it they're able to recite it they, if they say فَلَا أُقُسِمُ بِالْخُنَّسِ الْجَوَارِ الْكُنَّسِ وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا عَسْعَسْ وَالصُّبْحِ إِذَا تَنَفَّسْ إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ The قُوَّةٍ and continuous, right? Did you see here, new nation sometimes says خُنَّسْ I made sounds through my nose. This kind of articulation, this is how they memorize it. Someone who is not even to speak a sentence in Arabic. So the Quran, Allah, the God, made it easy to remember for this very reason of preserving the text for posterity. And not only giving you the confidence that what you are hearing is what the Prophet Muhammad recited back to the people from Angel Gabriel who received it from God. So you can be certain that this is what God is saying. When the God says, لا تشرك بالله don't ascribe partners to God. You know this is God commanding. You're not going to say, oh, maybe that man made it up or this person made it up. You know, your heart will resonate. This is what God is asking me. God is asking me to, you know what? Don't backbite. Don't insult. Don't mockery. Don't deceive. Be righteous. Don't, you know, what's, what's called, you know, to take the money and wealth of the orphans. God is saying that. You will say, no, I cannot do that anymore. When God says, Speak the truth, be a firm witness, truthful witness, even if it goes against you and against your kith and kin. You will say, I better change my life. Where I'm, you know how people say, your boss is saying, tell him I'm not here. Well, he's here or she's here. The Quran says, no, be a firm witness. You can't lie, you can't cheat, you can't deceive. So the Quran gives you the highest of all the morals. Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. He didn't come to bring you and teach you morality. Do you know what God says? He says, I have been raised only to perfect the nobility of character. You're noble already, but God is going to raise you and increase you in your nobility, in your perfection of character. That's the role of the Prophet Muhammad. It's not everyone's doom, death, 
and everyone's totally immoral. No, people have within them still. The fact that you should not kill, you should not steal, you should not rape. People have that instinctively. But God is raising your standard and saying, not only that, there are certain things you have to abide by constantly. No um, nepotism, despotism, no favoritism. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, even if Fatima, his daughter, were to steal, a hand should be chopped off. Meaning what? She should face the penalty. And the reasons why there's a harsh penalty is to protect the society. If I said, to give you an example, because I raised it, if the penalty of murder was 20 pounds, is it going to decrease crime of murder, being the same, or increase the crime? Amplify it. Someone's got 40 pounds, says, I'm going to get away with what? Two murders. Two murders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? When the Quran says, if you murder someone, in return your life will be taken away, you'll be thinking twice if you get caught. Yeah? If you stole someone which is not your property and you had no need for it, your hands will be chopped off. You'll be thinking twice. That is why only a few decades ago in Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, when the prayer time like you had just had came, people had their merchandise open in front of their shops. They would rush to pray to the mosque. They would not shut with a shutter. They would just cover their merchandise and go. There's no CCTV camera. What led them with this confidence that no one going to steal their, their merchandise? Both. <laughs> Both. Because in any kind of law, there is a deterrent aspect. The Quran utilizes or God utilizes the deterrent aspect of many of the legislations in which it deters people from committing that crime. There's a third one as well, and the awareness that God is watching them. Yeah, yeah, it's both. Because if, 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 look, if you, are, if you are someone God conscious, a pious individual, even if you see that, you will say, it's not mine. I'm not going to touch it. But those individuals who are saying, you know what, let me take it. They would think, ah, oh, what if I get caught? The deterrent effect applies on them. But you as an individual who is righteous, you don't have to think about deterrent. You will say, I love God. I worship God. Why am I going to go against God and steal something which is not even mine? Yeah? So the crimes that Islam gives, even though they are harsh, harsh for a reason. That is why you will see the crimes in societies like that when they put people in prison. What, what do they do? They collate and collaborate with each other to become better thief next time so that they don't get caught. But in Islam, there's no such thing as that, you know. But of course, there are various um, discretionary punishment. Not every punishment is capital punishment. There's only a handful which deserve capital punishment. Others are discretionary. The judge will decide whether it's a fine or whatever, whatever, right? But some crimes God has deemed to be detrimental to the welfare of the society. Something that goes against your honor, your dignity, your life, uh, you know, your, your mental well-being. God says, no, this is something that you can't. You know how many people, they, they commit domestic violence while they're drunk at home. They come and beat up their wife or their husband. And many, you know, I, I work in a hospital. I know in hospital at Naini, how many people come with injuries because of alcohol abuse. Yeah. The Quran says, they ask you about wine and gambling. They ask you, <laughs> they ask you about wine and gambling. God says, say, in them are some benefit and there's some harm. And the harm outweighs the benefit. So abstain from it. Alcohol may have some benefits in alcohol, dissolving certain chemicals we do use in medicines, for example. Um, but consuming alcohol, it defogs your mind. That's why Quran says, avoid altogether. Arab society where consuming wine like no other. Remember I said some poets were so good in describing wine. So when the Quran came, it came with a rehabilitation system in which in several steps it banned them. Initially it says, okay, you know, alcohol, you know, when you come to prayer, like we're going to go now shortly, so I have to go shortly, um, don't come when you're drunk. So people realize that, okay, because you have to say and you need to hear and understand what you're saying. So they, they were training them, like, oh, maybe alcohol isn't a good thing because I have to pray five times a day and so on. And gradually, gradually, the Quran introduced to them the alcohol, the handiworks of Satan's face, they were afraid. What they did at that time, they were all ready. They came with their barrels of wine and they broke this barrel on the streets and it was like flooding like river. That's how it was described in our historical books. And they were able to do that. 
So the Quran came to reform the society in a way that's practical too. So many of the reforms that you see in the Quran, it's not like you one day reform like that because God is just and merciful. He knows you better than you know, know yourself. So when the Quran wants to transform people from a polytheistic belief system to a monotheistic belief system, it does the same. It reasons with you. Why? It tells you, why do you worship something that cannot harm you or benefit you? You make with your own hands. Why do you worship them? It reasons with them. Say, why are you worshipping someone that cannot benefit you at all? And they know that because they made it themselves and various other reasons and the Quran engages them with them rationally. That is why you will find the Quran has so many of these called the didactics, whatever, I don't know the term for it. The Quran employs this kind of mechanisms to engage with people's mind and the heart so that eventually people surrender to its message. Because you'll be fighting and quarreling and fighting and, and, and even just say, oh, this is Quran has to be from God. Because you know it speaks to you and it speaks to you as if it knows you better than you know yourself. When you realize at that point, you know the Quran is from God. So we recommend you, you know, we, we humbly request you to look and read the Quran with an open reflection. Look for what it says. What does it say about God? What does it say about your purpose in life, which is to worship God? What does it say about hereafter, heaven and hell, and who's going to go there? The one who is an arrogant disbeliever, stubborn, arrogant disbeliever in God is going to go to hell. But the one who believes and the one who does righteous deeds as described in the Quran, for them are paradise, place of eternal joy, bliss. Then there, is a, there will be someone who will be then eventually, they will have to pass some of the tests. There will be people in the Allah Araf in between. There are some people in between and they will then have to have further tests for them to justify to themselves that they deserve to, not deserve, they are worthy of going to paradise or not. Sorry, actually, in, in the Bible, there's a verse that says about the lukewarm, those who sit on the fence, it says God will spew them out. So maybe, you know what I mean, you're, you're either here or you're not even, you're indecisive. Maybe yeah. you don't, don't really believe There's anyway. a chapter in the Quran called no, Al-A'raf. Yeah. Fitting on the fence, there is there. But people who are very sensible like yourselves, very inquisitive, very rational, very reasonable. When you read the Quran, you will see how the Quran engages with you on the level that you are. And if you disagree, ask yourself, why do I disagree? Do I disagree because of some kind of biases which is unjustified or biases that are justified? If a vegetarian says, oh, Quran says you can sacrifice an animal and eat, is it because they're bias of vegetarianism? Or is it because that's the reality you shouldn't be eating animals? If God allows you to eat vegetables and animals, and you're saying, look, but I don't feel like eating animals because I'm whatever, but you're not even made that way. You have enzymes in your body that digest meat. You have teeth, canine teeth that chews meat. You, you're actually made that way. So you can't justify saying, no, that's, I cannot become a Muslim because I'm a vegetarian. Because you know vegetarianism is an ideology that you have taken from a philosophy who themselves, the proponents of them, were meat eaters. Hinduism, where the philosophy comes from, they themselves were meat eaters. They were eating meats. They were sacrificed. The animals they were eating them, consuming them. It's in their scripture. But it's coming from a different tradition, different reasons why people are trying to be vegetarian. Because the idea of showing compassion and mercy, they want to extend to all other forms of creation. But with the detriment and harm from this universal principle of like eating animal products and so on. So is it the bias which is justified? What we will say, and I would submit, you would not find a single justifiable bias of disagreeing on the Quran, whether in its ethics, in morality, in its teachings of doctrine, or its laws and precepts. You will not find that. But you can only verify that after reading and scrutinizing the Quran yourselves. I can only, what's it called, tell you, but that's like preaching to you. It's not something about convincing you. You need to read yourself to be convinced of it. And the way you do that is reading the text with an open mind. And this is what our humble request to both of you, right? If you would like some Quran, we have English translation at the corner there. I can get some from our friend and give it to both of you. And you can follow me because I'm going to go that way. And ask questions because the, the, the root of learning is only when you ask questions because otherwise, if these questions are answered, you will not arrive to the truth because you will somehow bypass the truth. When you ask, and the answer is found and it makes sense, accept it. If the truth was found in, say, an ism, an ideology which is called, you know, blah 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 ism, 
we should be ready to accept it, whatever it might be. So we are saying the truth is in the final revelation in the Quran. If it's found in it, be ready to accept it. For whose benefit? For your benefit, not mine. For your benefit. You benefit for yourself in this life because God will give you a life of tranquility and happiness even more. And you will be safe from the hellfire in the hereafter. And you will be in the... Yes, important. People don't realize that. People don't want to talk about hellfire. People don't even think about death today. They don't not only think about death, they don't think about hellfire. But we... God says, God says, my friend, just one final thing. The final success is man zuhziha an in nar. The one who has saved himself from the hellfire is the one who is successful. Wa udkhil al jannah and entered paradise. This is a real success in the eyes of God. So it's not about how much money and wealth and fame and love and so on that you have. That is not the measure of success. Measure of a success of a human being is are we safe from the hellfire and are we entering the paradise because this life is momentary. How many years are you going to live? Another 150 years? No way. We don't live more than 120 years in this life anymore. But the heaven and hell, there will be no death. There will be life forever and ever and ever and ever. This life, which has no end compared to this life, it's not even twinkle of an eye. So why are we just immersing ourselves in this life when we should be feeling like so a traveler. When a traveler travels to one place to the other, like when you go to some country or somewhere, do you take everything and then you decorate the, the hotel that you go to, whether it's Hilton or you know Mer whatever, right? Do you say, oh, this is my life? No. You follow this as a transition to a place that you're going and you're going to come back to wherever. So why think this life is all that you got? This life should be thought of as a transition to the next real life, Darul Akhirah. This is the hereafter, which is the real life. God says the real abode, final abode of all destinations. So we have to be ready for that. We can't just simply say, I don't have time for that. I have parties to go, jobs to work with, and so on. Do we know when we're going to die? We don't. Yeah. We don't know when we're going to die. Because we don't know when we're going to die, we can't just live. <laughs> yes, and then of course you'll lose a chance because you'll one-way ticket to hell. Anyone who commits suicide, one-way ticket to hell. God doesn't give them paradise because you have taken something God has entrusted on you, life, which wasn't yours in the first place. And you took it away and you didn't fulfill your purpose. No. So in Islam, the, the legislation is clear. Suicide, hellfire, one-way ticket. All right? So that means we have to be ready before death approaches us to know and to fulfill the purpose, not only know the purpose, but to fulfill it. So if our purpose is to worship God, we must do that. We must worship God. So no. no. When you say it now, no, as in currently, no. no if, you, if you think about now, yeah. this is a relative term because hellfire and heaven is the abode in the hereafter. But anyone who's died, they've already known themselves what they've earned and what they have done in terms of their belief and so on. They would know if they're in their graves, whether the, the, the breath of fresh air coming from paradise or they're being punished within the graves because of they are the, 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 the aboders or what's it called, the inhabitants of the hellfire or not. So no one is actually in hell now? No, no. It's like the day of judgment has already happened the moment you're dead, right? So the, we're talking about a life or a time which is it's not like at, at, as our understanding of time in a total different way of time where it doesn't you know fit with our concept of time right it's, a concept. The, the, it's called the life of barzakh or a life in which you know everything is in a different world together right but at that time still you would not even realize people will eventually brought back to life again every single one of us will be resurrected and we will be in the front of god accountable for our belief and deeds. Every single one of us, we will be given our deeds, whether it's a good deed or bad deed. God tells us good deeds will be given on the right hand, bad deeds on the left hand. And our books will speak for ourselves. People at that, in, the, in the past they didn't know how can book record, record everything. When God says you have two angels on your shoulders recording all your good and bad deeds, people might think like how can it be? Now we know look how our digital media can record speech and vision and picture, moving picture on a solid state disc or you know SSD or whatever, right? On a CD, on a DVD, on a cassette. How do you even transcribe? Yeah, yeah. Cloud doesn't mean that, but we're talking about this. 
So these are recorded. So there are scribes who are recording all our actions. So you think, you know what? I did this thing. I stole someone. I raped someone and so on. You're going to get away with it? No. The evidence will present it to you. Very evidence, perhaps, all of this. You will see it in front of you. You cannot deny. Not only that, your hands, your legs, your skin, they will testify. God will give them the ability. Remember, the way we speak is what? It's just a machine that is assembled together that generates sounds which are meaningful as our brain tells us utter in this way. And we have agreed to understand these sounds to mean this. The skin, whatever, it's all the same thing. They will be assembled or they will be given the ability to speak or say things. It doesn't have to be vocal cords to speak, but they will speak. Just like when we say my, my phone speaks, it doesn't have a vocal cord, but it still speaks. There will be no getting away. So we will see everything. And God says, Whoever does an atom weight of good, like a weight, like a mustard seed, or the smallest ant, they will see it. And whosoever does an atom, meaning the smallest weight of things of a bad deed, they will see it. The good and the bad, no matter how small you've done, they will see it in the Day of Judgment. That means, remember, if you found one penny from someone's wallet and you took it and used it, you'll be accountable for that, even for one pence. Even for one pence. You think it's you know, just one pence? It wasn't yours to begin with. Or you may have stolen from someone, you know, stolen a lollipop. That wasn't yours. We have to account. That's why the Islamic lifestyle is such that every action we do, it falls in five categories. Is it totally prohibited? Is it obligatory? Is it recommended? Is it disliked? Or is it permissible? In the middle. Permissible means whether I drink apple juice or orange juice, it doesn't matter, it's permissible. It's not an obligation, it's not a prohibition, it's not a recommendation, or it's not dislike. Stealing, raping, killing, genocide, whatever, all forbidden acts. No Muslim can do that. Obligation. Obligation to speak the truth. To be honest. To be someone who is always upright. You know, all of these moral virtues, God, God has commanded, be nice to your mother and your father. Be kind. Don't even say, oof. Quran says, don't even say, oof, to your parents but extend the wings of mercy when they reach both reach old age that is how the Quran gives us the you know, legislations and moral guidance and so on every single thing that we do we need to know where does it fit in we can pray our obligatory prayers like I'm gonna go now and we can do extra prayers we call voluntary prayers these are either recommended or it could be something that's permissible, but anything that's recommended and so on, I can get more and more reward. So Muslims always try to worship more, more and more God, to earn this reward more and more. The reason being to please Allah. It's not that when you love someone, do you love on defense? You love with all your heart. You even want to die for them, isn't it? That's the love that is expressed in its fuller form. You want to even die for them. Say, I will die for you, whatever you, you know. So when you want to worship Allah with all your love, you want to do exactly what he says, even more, even more, even more, right? So we should try to reform ourselves to come away from friends and to show the love of our God to what he deserves, right? As much as we can. And that's what Muslim always constantly tries to do that. And that is known as jihad. That is the inner struggle that we all do to perfect our nobility to become more and more righteous and virtuous in the sight of God, that's the internal struggle. Of course, I'm struggle to defend your country, to your, of your religion, of your honor and so on. Of course, it's also called you know, jihad, but the jihad of the nafs is that what we're talking about. So don't somehow be confused with people saying, oh, jihad means just chopping your heads in a battle. It's not like that. So as Muslims, when you become one, what will transform you? you will, it will free you from the shackles of slavery to fashion, slavery to people's dictates, slavery to economic machinery, and it will make you a servant God who is willingly submitting and surrendering to the one they love and appreciate and revere and they want to worship. That is what Islam will make you. You will feel honored and dignified when you put your head on the ground worshiping God and giving him thanks and not doing that to any human being. 
because your honor and your dignity, you will not bow down to any man. How much powerful, how much rich they may be. Whether they're king and the leaders, I'm going to go. Yeah, leaders, whatever they might be, right? So I'm going to wrap up now because my brothers are going. Um, I hope the conversation that we had will give you a, a starting point to, to, to start your journey in exploring Islam and God opens up your heart to the truth of Islam. You from Jamaica? Yeah. Far Jamaica from. Fort Moore. Fort Moore, yeah? yeah. Okay? Yeah. And, and thank you. Um, I appreciate you listening. Um, an intelligent question that you asked. I mean, signs of someone who's very, very intelligent. Okay? You know, um, do you know the history of Islam in Jamaica? Okay. I'm going to go, brother. If you want to continue, that's yeah. fine.